sing all three verses, after which we'll have our opening prayer. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within There at the cross where he took me in Glory to his name Glory to his name Glory to his name, to his name. There to my heart was the blood Glory to his name. O oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his <coughs> name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Number 638. 638, we'll sing all three verses, after which we'll have our scripture reading. 638. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 the roll is called up yonder, the roll is called up yonder I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share, when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun let us talk of all his wondrous love and care then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 I'll be there
I'm assisting with the scripture reading this morning. Matthew 7, verses 18 through 20. Verse 18 and 19 read, A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20. Verse 20. Good job. If you want to mark the invitation, it'd be number 674. 674 will be our invitation. After you get that marked, go ahead and turn to 5. 45. 545, and we'll stand and sing the first, second, and fourth verse, after which we'll have our message. 545. <coughs> this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't Feel at home in this world anymore They're all expecting me And that's one thing I know My Savior pardoned me And now I onward go I know he'll take me through Though I am weak and poor And I can't feel at home In this world anymore Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door And I can't feel at home in this world anymore Good morning and welcome everyone to the Euphoria Church of Christ. It's good to see you all here. I'm genuinely happy to see everyone, most everyone here today. Uh, I, I kid, of course. I aggravate him. I'm happy to see Eddie too. Uh, but I'm glad to see you all. I'm, I'm thankful you're here with us as we continue to worship and study in this Sermon on the Mount series. For those that are book readers, those that enjoy reading, those that enjoy spending time in the pages might enjoy this. Uh, there was a bestseller book that came out uh, about three years ago that I thought was interesting. This book was titled The Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook. Now, this book gives advice uh, from experts in different fields over how to handle worst case type scenarios uh, for all kinds of different situations. Uh, how to fend off a shark. How to deliver a baby in a taxi cab how to jump from a moving car, how to survive, I thought this one was funny, how to survive if a parachute fails. I'm not going skydiving. 
so I don't have to worry about that. But that would just seem, I don't know how you survive if parachute fell. But one of the scenarios that stuck out with me and why this is part of the study today is there was one that read, what to do if you're confronted by an angry mountain lion? What to do if you're confronted by an angry mountain lion? The outcome, again, doesn't look good for me, especially if it's me and Tyler, for instance, standing in the woods and a mountain lion comes up. It's like T-bone versus stealth over here. I'm not, it's not going to turn out very good for me. But what, what this expert said, and what I found was so humorous, said just open your coat and appear to be bigger than you are. Just appear to be larger than you are and try to intimidate this mountain lion in the hopes that he will run off. And when I read that, I just kind of smiled because it tied in so much with our lesson today. So much so. For this reason right here. How many people live today wanting to project this larger than image life? want to appear to be bigger and badder than they are. They want to be the big dog so that no one dares mess with them, a need to impress people to be both the smartest, the most confident, so then they become masters of things like manipulation, self, uh, lack of self-control. And what they end up doing is building this incredible glass house around themselves. But what do you think happens the moment that glass house starts to crumble down? It's not going to be very good. So again, we are in our study on the Sermon of the Mount, but our focus for today is going to be on the look of a citizen of the kingdom of God. What, what does it look like to be a citizen of the kingdom of God? Now, I've used this verse that was our uh, scripture reading a few different times here lately just because of really that ending verse that Mason read. That really hits the point. So much so. Every good tree bears fruit. Bad trees bear bad fruit. We, we recognize this. This is not a hard concept to understand. But jump down to verse 20. Like I said, that's the main emphasis for this scripture reading here. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. So how can you look at someone and know their citizenship status? I'm not talking about their citizenship status to the United States of America or wherever it may be. I'm talking about their citizenship status to either the kingdom of God or the world. How can you look at them and tell the difference? By their fruits. You will know them by what you see them doing, how you see them acting, the speech that is spewing from their lips. Because here's the point. These things cannot be separated from the person. They come from the person's heart. You've heard me say this before, the heart will rat you out every single time. You will know them by their fruits. And as you will see today, there is a clear distinction between the two, between a citizen of the kingdom of God and a citizen of the world. Now, before we get going, I want to point out a sad point for you. A disappointing, frustrating, you can put all different kind of descriptive terms with it. Would you like to know one of the greatest challenges that Christians face today? It is a desire to act like everyone else around us. And I mentioned this on Wednesday night when we were studying through the book of 1 Kings. What was it the Israelites wanted so bad? Well, we want a king like we are. Why? Well, I want to be like our neighbors are. I want to be like... The Canada, oh, you mean the group you were told to go destroy. That's who you want to be like. Well, yeah, I want to be like everybody else. And that's what they said. We want a king like us. But what happened when they got exactly what they asked for? How did it look for the civilization, the society there, the Israelites, when they got what they asked for? Well, hang on, Justin. That's the easy way to life. I mean, why would that be such a bad thing? Whatever the crowd is doing... Whatever the crowd is thinking, that's fine with me. I, I'm, I'm going to go along. Many people live just like that. Well, if the majority says it's fine, I'm fine with it. That's all that matters. What's the popular opinion? That's, that's what really matters. But I want you to understand this point, and I cannot stress this point enough to you. God has always, and God will always, 
call his children to be different. You will not read in the Bible where God tells his children to blend in, to fit in, and just try to get along. You will read in the Bible where God has called his children out of something, out of the world, out of this society that was evil. Come out of there. We read about being light in a dark world, salt in an unflavored existence. So today, we're going to spend some time looking at the Beatitudes. This is likely the most well-known section of Scripture when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount. But I want to look with this idea of a comparison between a citizen of the kingdom and a citizen of the world. And what does Jesus say the differences are? What does Jesus say the characteristics are if you're going to be in this group? Now, real quick, I want you to notice something because we tend to miss this part a little bit. Some of these don't sound very pleasant. When you hear, blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are those that mourn. Well, those don't sound good at all. I don't want to be in that group. That doesn't sound pleasant. When Jesus says blessed here, that word carries the same connotation as the word happy. Happy are those that are doing this. Happy are those that are being persecuted. Happy are those that are mourning. Why? Why in the world would those be happy? Well, let's look at them and see. First one we're going to look at, Matthew 5, verses 1 through 3. Go ahead and turn over there. That's where we'll spend probably 99% of our time will be in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verses 1 through 3. And seeing the multitudes, he, Jesus, of course, went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, now, I want you to notice the one he starts with. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what is a very basic view in the world's minds today? One of the most common attributes you will come across is the belief in someone that I don't need anybody. I don't need anything from anyone. I don't need help. What do I need you for? I don't need anybody. I certainly don't need God. What do I need him for? I am all that I need in myself. Now, a sad thing we find when we turn over to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, we find a church struggling with this problem. A church of all things, a church at Laodicea. Revelation 3, verse 17, because you say, here, this is the church saying this, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. What does the Lord say? And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I am in need of nothing. No, you're miserable. You are poor, you are blind, you are naked. Oh, what truth there is in this statement. You think you have everything. You're wrong. Well, look at what all I've done for myself. Look at the house that I've built and all the toys and the shiny possessions I've acquired for myself. That was, that was my doing. That was my ability to be able to go and do something like that. What do I need from anyone? Look, because I've done this myself. The Lord says you have nothing. You're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now, do you think that was a message meant to be left in Revelation? No, it doesn't stop in Revelation. The world today says, I am independent, and I like it that way. The Lord says, you are nothing, and you don't even realize it. Blessed are the prideful and the powerful. No, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that recognize a very important fact. They cannot do it on their own. And more importantly, they know they're nothing without God. John 15, verse 5, Jesus speaking, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Notice that ending there. For without me you can do nothing. Without me you can do nothing. If you're ever going to be cleansed from your sins, if you're going to enjoy the spiritual blessings offered to you, then it comes from one specific thing. 
Your relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus says, happy are those that recognize that fact. You see how different these groups are? They're not close. They're not close at all. But the people in the world, they look so happy, don't they? Don't they look like they have it figured out? Don't they look like they have every single thing they can ask for? Jesus says they're miserable, poor, naked, and blind. They don't even realize it. They don't even know it. Second beatitude Jesus mentions, or blessed are those who mourn in verse 4, for they shall be comforted. Again, the world's view is the complete opposite of what Jesus teaches. And in fact, that statement I just made is going to come to sound like a broken record by the time this sermon is over. You're going to get tired of hearing me say, well, look at the difference between the world and the church because they're so different. The world says, you know what? Who cares about my behavior? Who cares about my behavior? Who cares about the idea of sin? It's not a big deal to me. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. I'm not going to apologize for it. Simply put, who cares? Who cares? Now jump with me from Revelation all the way back to the second book of the Bible in Exodus. All the way back to Exodus. Moses went before Pharaoh with this certain message in chapter 5. God wants his people let go from captivity. Moses is his messenger to go before Pharaoh. What do you think Pharaoh's response is going to be? Verse 2 of chapter 5, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. Nor will I let Israel go. Who is God, and why do I care what he has to say to me? Why do I care the message you're bringing me from God? Well, that's the attitude of a lot of people today. But I want you to look specifically at the attitude towards sin. That's really the focus I want to to hone in here. It's nobody's business what I do but mine, right? I'm my own boss. Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn. Now, we can look at mourning a loved one. We can look at mourning our country. We can look at mourning our society, our church, and the state that we're in in this country, the way the church is under attack. We can look at all these things. But I want to keep this in its proper context. You see, what did we just talk about? Because often when you hear, blessed are the mourn, we take those in nine different directions. But keep that in the context of what we just read. Blessed are the poor in spirit, now blessed are those that mourn. See, these beatitudes are connected with one another. And they flow in a certain manner. Blessed are those that are bothered by their sin, and they mourn that fact. They've already recognized that they can't do it on their own. They need God. So now they're mourning the fact that their sins are with them. And Jesus says, blessed are those that recognize that. Because they are the ones that will be comforted. Don't think for a single moment God does not want your sins to bother you. Don't think that for a moment. When you know in your heart that something you've done is wrong, do you think that's just you going, oh, that might not be right. God wants our sins to bother us. Why? So we will do something about them. It's not that hard to figure out. Of course He wants them to bother us. Friends, we need to live a lot more like the public and a lot less like the Pharisees. A lot more like the public and a lot less like the Pharisees. They want, God wants, not they, God wants our sins to bother us. The Pharisee says, I'm glad I'm not like the sinner in Luke chapter 18. I'm just glad I'm not like this person. Could you imagine being like that? But the publican, who would be looked at in the worst of lights as a publican, said this, God be merciful to me a sinner. Blessed is the man that recognizes his sins 
and mourns that fact. Why? He will be comforted because of that mourning. Third beatitude Jesus mentions, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Inherit the earth. The first five. I'm trying to leave out some syllables. Blessed are the meek. Now, we talked about this in a study, I guess three weeks ago now, on the purpose of the Bible and proving the Bible. How, how can we prove it? See, the church recognizes this certain fact, the, the reality there that there are inherent guiding principles in man. We have something guiding us, and Scripture supports that fact all throughout it. The world stance on the other side, if you remember from that study, is that might makes right. Strength is all you need. Don't worry about guiding principles. Might makes right. We see this in politics. We see this in business. We see this in the reckless lives of many people today. But we're not worried about guiding principles. We're worried about what am I able to do. Jesus says, blessed are the meek. And remember, God has called us to be different. So he calls us to have an attitude of meekness, the ability to have self-control within one, to be able to, to self-discipline oneself. Now that's even more of a struggle for a lot of people, to be able to have self-discipline. I don't want you to confuse this point, though, because when we start saying meek, if I were to call on Will and get him to come up here, or maybe even Levi, and I said, if I tell you something's meek, I want you to be meek, what do you think that means? Well, meekness is often attributed to weakness. But it's the exact opposite. Well, he's just a lowly Christian. No, meekness is power under control. Meekness is not weakness, but power under control. Think about Jesus for just a moment. God in the flesh. All the power, as we're studying uh, in the beginning, the book of Genesis on, well, to be tonight, this week, uh, in Genesis chapter 1, God spoke the world into existence. That power was wrapped inside of flesh by the name of Jesus Christ. All the power of the world He had in His body. The seas obeyed Him. Demons fled from Him. The dead raised when He called them. That's the power that Jesus said that he had. But notice what he said. Take my yoke upon you, Matthew 11, verse 29, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. But you're God in the flesh. You were present from the beginning. I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. Blessed are those that are meek, for they will inherit the earth. How many people today would claim to be powerful? I'm strong. I have the ability. Might make sure I can go take it. I can go do it for myself. Jesus said they have nothing. They're miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Blessed are the meek. The fourth beatitude he mentions, and I understand I'm moving kind of quick. Uh, the fourth beatitude, or blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled in verse 6. Now, you'll notice these concepts overlap a bit. I don't need anything. I certainly don't need God. And it's funny, though, when I, when I hear someone say that, what do I need from God? Do you know that when you go back to the history of man, roughly 6,000 years, not billions and billions they keep saying, because they can't even agree on that, roughly 6,000 years ago, the creation of man, the creation of the heavens and earth, there has been an inherent principle inside of us to worship. There is a desire and a need inside of a person to worship. Now, it hasn't always been God. It will not always be God for a lot of people. How many people in societies then went and made their own gods? And we read and can study about these Canaanite cultures and their pagan-filled, I'm always there to say godless, because in their mind they're God-filled nations. There is this need inside of man to worship. So 
Some consider themselves their own gods. The only thing they thirst for is more of what they already have and more of what they want. Everything they cherish so much will do what in one day? Crumble, rust, fade away. The money, the fame, the possessions will all be gone. And then what? What's left after a wasted life? Jesus taught in Luke chapter 12 a parable about a rich farmer. Now this rich farmer, we're, we're familiar with his parable, talking to a mature audience, had an incredible crop this year. He had so much so that he filled his barns and had no room for all the stuff. So what does this rich farmer do? Does he take his crop and say, well, I'm going to share it with those that don't have because I have an abundance? No. He says, I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build a bigger barn to hold all my stuff and that way we can eat, drink, and be merry. I have my stuff, so everything is good. Verse 20 of Luke chapter 12. God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then those, then whose will those things be which you have provided? You want to know what one of the hardest questions many people face today? And this is such a simple question. Just two words that people face it and they don't know how to answer and they really struggle with it? Then what? Two words. Then what? Well, I have all the stuff I could ever want. Then what? I'm as powerful as I could ever be. Then what? Your soul will be required of you tonight. Then what? <coughs> Seems like such a simple question. Jesus told his followers, you don't hunger for things like this. This is a worldly concept. They don't matter. You hunger and thirst for righteousness, and if you do, you will be filled. We need a lot less in our society of what pleases me and more of what pleases God. The fifth beatitude mentioned, and blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, verse 7. What's the motto you hear so often today? And I could ask Tyler because he probably deals with this on a daily basis. Look out for number one. Don't worry about the rest. Don't worry about everybody else. Don't worry about what happens to someone else. You look out for number one. Who cares what other needs? That's their problem. That's not my problem. There are two kinds of people in the world that would fall under this group here. And the opposite of merciful, you have those that will only come to you when they need something from you. Then you have those that will only ever see you as they're looking down to step over you. Yet Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those that are moved by the needs of others. Blessed are those that are willing to help those around them. Again, I'm, I'm kind of jumping between Matthew and Luke. Luke chapter 10, we can find another well-known account. I don't have time to really pull them up and go through them. Of the Good Samaritan. There was a man robbed and beaten, a man left for dead on the side of the road. Who were the first two that saw this man? A priest and a Levite. You know what they did? Well, I don't have time to stop. I, I can't get dirty. I'm going to go to the other side of the road. I'm going to leave that man said it. In comes a Samaritan and helps the man. Jesus said, which of these three do you think was neighbor to him to fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. See, a worldly mindset is no different than a priest and a Levite in the account of the good Samaritan. In fact, the phrase I've been using a lot here lately, a looked apart Christian, is not really any different than that category either. They're across the road. They don't have time. You know how much time it would take for me to stop and help that man? <clears throat> you know how much it would take for me to stop, stop what I'm doing, and help somebody that's in need? 
That's their own problem. They got themselves in that situation. That's their fault. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. Then he gave these instructions for you and I to show mercy. You know what the sad thing is? That should be easy for us. Where would any one of us today be in this building without mercy? Without the mercy that God shows us that Jesus Christ nailed to the cross. Blessed are the merciful should be the easy one. The sixth beatitude Jesus mentioned, again, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Why do you think the desire is such as it is to be like everyone else around us? I mentioned in the very beginning that's one of the biggest problems that we face as Christians today. You'll know what one of the main reasons is? Well, look at what all they get to do. Look at all the fun they get to have. I should put fun in air quotes. Look at what they get to do. Why can't I do that? I want to go do that. How much of the Bible is plagued with this mindset? But they look like they're having fun. There is a lie upon man today that says if I keep things to myself, if I keep it in my head, I don't talk about it, I don't show it, then it's fine. So I can look at whatever I want on my computer. I can look at this person that walks by however I want. I won't say anything about it. Because it's just in my head. That's not hurting anybody. But they reveal the problem. And it's a heart problem. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, not those that chase down every desire, not those that give in to temptation. And there will be. The devil's good at what he does. Blessed are the pure in heart. Next to last, number seven. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, I'm, I mentioned this again, and I don't mean to laugh. I, I go back to the study that we had on this. And I mentioned to you that city, the atheist-driven city, the atheist-designed city, a city without God. Many atheists today claim, and atheists in the past, it's not a new, a new thought here, that a world without God would be a utopia. It, it would be great. And in fact, they tried a city, liberal Missouri, they tried that. I, I told you about that city a couple of weeks ago. It failed miserably. Why? It's, it's a utopia. There's no God there. Why would it fail miserably? Well, what happens in a godless society? Rampant crime, lewd acts, lascivious lifestyles, constant fighting, just to name a few. Tyler, would you want to go and be a police officer in liberal Missouri? But, but it's utopia. Because you remove the inherent guiding principles that come from God. See, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Those are the ones that are peaceful in relationships. They're not just looking to take advantage of each other. Paul said in Romans 12, verse 18, If possible, live peaceably with those you like and those you can tolerate, those that you're at church with on Sundays. He said, If possible, live peaceably with all men. With all men. Finally, the, the eighth, I got it where I was going, the eighth beatitude. Verse 10, and I just got uh, verse 10 on here only. Blessed are you, or blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You can keep going and read verse 11. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, you can go right back to the study that we had on the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. And see what life looks like as a Christian on the Christian walk being persecuted by all those around. But the important takeaway from the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts is that his situation never dictated his purpose. His situation never controlled his purpose. There were always opportunities not to complain, not to gripe. 
James 1, we find this statement, Count it all joy when you face various trials. Who in the world finds it joyous? Do we look at it like that? The world doesn't. Who would find something like that joyous? Blessed are. Happy are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The invitation today is going to be very simple. I'll go back. You write, since you're writing it down, I'll go back. The invitation is going to be simple this week. Jesus laid out several comparisons. You can see them on the screen. Several comparisons. Which side do you fall under? It's a question only for you. I'm not asking you to speak up. I'm not asking you to raise your hand and point to a side. It's a question only for you. Which side describes you? If it's the world's view, then I want you to understand something important. Very important. There is no reward in heaven for that mindset. Jesus said, blessed are those that are poor in spirit, those that mourn, those that are meek, those that hunger and thirst, those that are merciful, those that are pure in heart, the peacemakers and the persecuted. For great is their reward in heaven. So if you are described by the world's view, I want you to understand that there is no reward in heaven for you. That's something you need to search yourself and understand that point, and I pray you would. God has always and will always continue to call his people to be different. Jesus says, happy are these people. If you're not a child of God, this is your opportunity. Philip's going to lead us in an invitation song here in just a moment. And I want you to genuinely ask yourself that question. Was it the world side that described me more or was it the kingdom side that described me more? And you search your heart and you find that answer. Whatever we can do to help you, I would ask that you make that call at this time. Hear, believe, repent of your sins, confess the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and be baptized with the remission of your sins. If we as a congregation here at Euphoria can help you in any, any way, this is your time to come forth now as the rest of us stand and as we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul? Cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the 
soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb. All your garments spotless are they white as snow. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, if you would, turn to number 51. 51. <clears throat> Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, within the sacred page, I I got my Bible, don't worry, I'm not about to start preaching again. Don't, I don't want anybody, especially Eddie, to get them storm out. Before we take the Lord's Supper, I want to read just two verses for you. I want you to think about something. Because you've heard me mention several times that, and most everybody that prays, may we do so in a manner well-pleasing. Why do we say that? Is there a concern about how we take the Lord's Supper? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I want you to notice, you see the verses on the screen. But I want you to notice the next two verses, 27 and 28. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. It absolutely matters how we partake of this sacrifice. The the Remembrance of the sacrifice. So this is your opportunity as we prepare to take this that you put away the thoughts and the cares and the concerns of the world and focus on the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on our behalf. Pray with me if you will. Our holy God and Father in heaven, hallowed be thy great and merciful name. Our Father, I'm so thankful for the opportunity that we have had as brethren to assemble, to sing songs of praise, to offer prayers, to open your word and to take of this uh, remembrance that we have of the body and blood of Jesus Christ shed on Calvary's cross. As we partake of this bread that represents his body, may we search ourselves and do so in a manner that's pleasing to thy sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. believe that's everyone. Bow with me once again, if you will. Our God and Father in heaven, now we come praying over this fruit of the vine that to us as Christians represent the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary's cross. And how grateful we are as your children that that blood flows down the cross and washes clean of our sins. May we partake of this emblem in a manner that's well pleasing to thy sight and according to thy word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Because we're still not passing trays around uh, because of the virus, of course, we are, the collection plate is still in the back. 
If you will, bow with me one final time and we'll pray for that collection. Our holy God and Father in heaven, now we give our thanks at the conclusion of the Lord's Supper for the blessings of this life that you have bestowed upon us, the ability to earn and provide a living for our families, the abilities to just provide for ourselves. Father, we know and we recognize that these abilities come from you. Father, I'm grateful now that we have this opportunity to give, not from our hands, but from our hearts, back to the continuation of your services here at Euphoria Church of Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.